Father, again, it is always our privilege to be able to bow uh, before you, the God of the universe, the one who spoke creation into existence. We think of our earthly structures, and we don't have ready access to the president or or the governor. We don't uh, have uh, uh, instant access to those who are considered important in our culture and our society, and yet we can bow our heads and have direct access to you. And so, Father, we are grateful that you have made yourself known to us and that uh, week by week we can uh, not only pray to you, but get your words uh, through the word, through the Bible. And so I pray that as we gather in this beautiful evening, that we would have good time in your word as we look for your truth. We look for encouragement and strength. Father, we want to fulfill what your word calls us to, and that is you call us to know you. And so may this be in the building of our knowledge of you, not merely just to know about you, but in building our relationship with you. And in that, that it would help us and encourage us to be able to live for you to be able to think godly thoughts and walk a godly walk. So I pray that this would bring encouragement as we look into your word. I pray for clarity and for truth. We pray that your spirit would lead us and guide us into your righteousness, Father. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus and through the power of the spirit. Amen. All right. Well, we have been looking at this uh, sort of module in the last... Uh, since January, uh, in the last uh, month and a half, two months, uh, whatever it is, uh, we called it our call. And it's really the idea that uh, we as men and, and really all people, all believers, are called to a specific purpose in salvation. That is, we are saved for a purpose. Some of the things that I've said before, just to sort of remind you of, God saves you as a believer. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he saved you because he loves you. And and there's another thing. He saves you, he saves me, he saves us because he loves others. That is, along with our own salvation is this call to be a testimony unto the nations. It's not merely an individual call. It's really articulated, especially in the New Testament, as a call to the church. The church is called to live out a faithful life, to to show a life of obedience, ultimately before the world or before the nations, and uh, in that, uh, draw uh, people to their own. So I'm going to talk about sort of a way to articulate the the problem that we face or the the, the major problem, and uh, we'll work towards talking about uh, some solutions this evening as we look into God's Word. So if we think about what's wrong with the world, it's easy to see and to say all sorts of different, we would have different ways of talking about it. We might say, well, you know, in our culture, we've lost our way. We have a lot of political division, right? And of course, that's true. We have lots of that. And, 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 and we have a lot of corruption, we might say. Uh, and, and that's true. There, there's corruption. Or we look at the world stage and we see uh, some of the other countries around the world and what they're involved in and it's it's easy to 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 see all the different things going on and 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 sort of list all the different kinds of trouble the kinds of problems that we have and we could even bring it all the way down to things like economics is is our economy being managed the right way and 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 all the different types of things but behind all those things why do people behave badly why do people sin why do we sin and, and, and so I'd like you to think of the problem, the master problem in different terms than our world discusses them. Not, it's not about politics. It's not about international relations. It's not about economics. I want you to think about it this way. Every person on earth, every person is made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. Every person bears the image of God. And here's the problem. Too many people bear the image of God poorly. Either A, they don't even know the God in whose image they've, uh, they've been made. Uh, 
That is, there are people in places that have never heard the gospel. They're made in the image of God and they do not know the God in whose image they're made. That is, they don't know who he is and what he has done for them. Others might know and not be interested. They might know and rebel against living for God. And ultimately, that becomes the problem. And I want us to think about why. Why is that the big issue? Why does that become uh, the problem? I I don't do this too often, but I'm going to do it uh, this evening. I want to use a a quote, and uh, I want to talk about it a little bit. We we have talked about our call and sort of being a a testimony to the nations. We've used lots of different language and different passages over the last uh, several weeks together in in looking at the the call, and and there's a a missional component about reaching nations and so on, but but that can become skewed, and and so some of what we're going to do this evening is really for... Um, uh, to make sure we don't uh, misrepresent something. So I begin with this quote, missions exists because worship doesn't. Missions exists because worship doesn't. It's a quote that was written from a book from John Piper. I'll show you the source here. The book is called Let the Nations Be Glad. It was released in 1992, and it was one of the books that, if you've heard the name John Piper, he's a pastor for many years at Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and has a radio ministry and, and an online ministry called Desiring God and written many books and a conference speaker and so on. But when he wrote this book, this really brought him into the forefront, talking about the the relationship between missions and worship. Like I said, it came out in 92. It just last year, they did the the 30th anniversary of this book. It's become a textbook in a lot of uh, Bible colleges and seminaries related to missions. The uh, sort of subtitle, I don't know if you can make it out or not, is The Supremacy of God in Missions. And so it begins, missions exist because worship doesn't. That's not quite actually right. This is how it begins. And I'm actually going to include the whole quote here. This is the opening paragraph of the book. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exists because worship doesn't. Worship, the praise of God, is ultimate, not missions. Because God is ultimate, not man. My way of saying that is people made in the image of God don't know the God in whose image they're, they've been made. And so they don't worship their creator. Now, before we get too caught up, because sometimes, especially in today's culture, worship is so tightly tied to music. Let's leave music out of it. Uh, Worship, probably the best synonym we can use biblically would be a word more like sacrifice, uh, giving praise to God through the sacrificial living of our lives. So this is what how the book starts. It, it, it's this idea that we are involved in telling people, or if I can say it my way, telling image bearers about the God in, in whose image they, they were made. As we are involved in that, that is so that God would receive what he is rightly due. So our problem is not missions. Our problem is worship. We have people made in the image of God, who do not worship the God in whose image they're made. The paragraph goes on. I'll just finish it out here. When this age is over, John Piper writes, and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. That is, the purpose of reaching, going and reaching, is good and it's important, but it's not eternal. That is, there is an ending time to it. And so Piper writes, when this age is over, the countless millions of redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship is therefore the fuel and the goal of missions. And so I want to tie that back to what we've been talking about. We've talked about our call, and, and, and I would say sometimes we think 
a lot about the fact that if we are called to go, we, we think a lot about, you know, maybe I'm supposed to go to another country and be in a faraway place. And there's certainly a part of that. The church is called to, to send the appropriate people to go to the places the Lord is leading and guiding and, uh, and to, to reach people. But if you've been with us, primarily the way in which we bear witness is a faithful, obedient life. That is, our call is to live faithfully as men here of Stonebriar. Our call is to live faithfully in a world, in a culture that isn't faithful to God as a testimony to who he is and what he's done. So that, that, that comes across scripture in words like righteous living or obedience or walking in the way of the Lord or holy living. We looked at lots of different passages that talk about it lots of different ways, but that is the way of testifying or being a testimony to the nations. Uh, That is living rightly before the Lord. In other words, reflecting the Lord in our life. And so I want to think about this a little bit, this appropriate place for praise and worship and how that might be tied. This is an interesting paragraph for us to consider, uh, but how that might be tied to the issue of our call. What is it like to be a church that is called to the work of God, called to the purposes of God, called to walk obedience in the way of the Lord, and how is that tied to worship? And so if you have your Bibles, make your way to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65 is where we're going to begin this evening. Isaiah is a long book, 66 chapters in total. We're looking at the second last chapter. And Isaiah has an interesting arrangement, the way it's put together. And it's important to know when we turn there is the kind of what we're looking for. Um, Isaiah 1 through 39, the first 39 chapters are, are uh, lots of different things, but one of the things it's specifically addressing Isaiah's generation. He, he's really pointing to here, we now, uh, we are called into repentance, called to return back to God. Isaiah is a prophet who speaks when, when Israel is in a state of spiritual decline. Really at, at a, towards the end of Isaiah's life is where Israel is going to go to the lowest of low. They're idolaters. They're worshiping other gods. And towards the end of, uh, Isaiah's life, they're going to end up adopting the practice of child sacrifice and the worship of Molech. And so it is the ugliest of times for, I, I said the nation of Israel, really we're talking about Judah, uh, Israel's in the divided time, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. In Isaiah's lifetime, we're going to lose uh, uh, Israel in the north to Assyria, and he'll continue to uh, be a prophet to the south. And, uh, and and so that first 39 chapters, Isaiah 1 through 39, Isaiah is writing specifically to his generation. The reason I say it like that is Isaiah 40 through 55 is really Isaiah writing to the next generation. That is, he, he is writing and speaking, or God is inspiring him to tell that next generation who ultimately are going to go into exile right? It's after the life of Isaiah that Babylon's going to come and it's going to take Judah and they're going to take Judah back to Babylon. It's going to be three different waves or three different trips. And and they're going to take the people of Judah out of Judah back to Babylon uh, for a 70-year exile. In fact, Babylon doesn't have a time frame on it. God has a time frame of 70 years. They're just going to take them back. And, and so that next generation really gets addressed in Isaiah 40 through 55. And then Isaiah 56 through 66, the last 10 chapters, address all future generations. So when I say, let's turn to Isaiah 65, that is we are in the chunk, the last 10 chapters of Isaiah, that, that really Isaiah is prophesying to all future generations in the way that uh, the book and the prophecies have been uh, arranged. And so you'll see that here in just a moment. It's Isaiah's going to have a vision of the future, and we'll pick it up in verse 17, Isaiah chapter 65, 
verse 17. So God is speaking through uh, the prophet Isaiah, and God says, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Um, The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. So let's just stop there, make sure we understand sort of what we're reading. Isaiah is speaking of this, this future time, this, this, this future time, which for us, this isn't fair to Isaiah and his people, but for us, because we have the whole Bible, we read something very similar to this in the book of Revelation, right? The, the introduction of this idea of a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem coming down. So these are the first prophetic utterings of what will later be recorded in the book of Revelation, which is future for Isaiah, but past for us, right? We all have Revelation in our, in our Bible. So uh, Isaiah, or God, is casting this vision um, through the prophet Isaiah. And he's talking about here this new heavens, this new earth, uh, and be glad, rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to be a joy. So we got to kind of picture what's going on here. The, 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 the nation of Judah is at the lowest of low when Isaiah is prophesying this, and he's prophesying about a new heaven and a new earth and, and everything being good and Jerusalem being a, a delight and the people being being a joy. So this is nothing like what the people are facing, but it is a vision of the future. I will rejoice over Jerusalem, God says, and I will take delight in my people, and the sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. No more weeping, no more crying in Jerusalem. You can hear the echoes of what uh, John will later write in the book of Revelation. Uh, never again will there be in it an infant in Jerusalem, an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere child, and the one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. This is poetic language, right? To, to talk about the idea of long life, long, no, no infant deaths, uh, long life. And, and is he talking about sort of a, a, a perfect future? Is he talking about, uh, the, 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 the end or the millennial reign? It, it's not exactly clear and different scholars look at this differently, but he, clearly he's picturing this wonderful time when, when there isn't the weeping and mourning and there's long life. Longevity is, is the key that's being highlighted there. They will build houses and dwell in them, and they will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them. That is, Jerusalem had been attacked and been, in some cases, repopulated with other people. Assyrians had come down for a, a period of time, and so no longer will they build houses and other live them or uh, live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people." Now, again, if you're not in a good agrarian, you may not go as the days of a tree. Trees live a long time. That's really the idea. So a long life, uh, trees can live, especially olive trees, which are probably the most common in, the, in, in Israel. Uh, they can leave, live literally over a thousand years, maybe even up to 2,000 years. Not exactly sure. I'm not an olive tree expert in any way. So they live a long time. That's the imagery here that's being given. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They won't labor in vain, uh, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Verse 24, before they call, I will answer. Uh, While they are still speaking, I will hear. And now in imagery, the wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like, like the ox and the dust will be on the serpent's food. Serpent will be dead. Food gets dusty is the idea. Uh, and there will neither be harm nor, uh, uh, they will, <clears throat> excuse me, they will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. So, so this is a piece of a prophetic vision of a time to come that Isaiah is giving to these people who are lost in sin and, and, and worshiping foreign gods and bowing down to idols. And, and the vision is this beautiful vision of long life and tranquility. Every, everything is just beautiful. Everything is just perfect. 
Th that's what Isaiah was prophesying. And if you've been familiar with the book of Revelation, that's what is yet to come, right? There will be a day of no more weeping and no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, and ultimately no more death. Uh, we will spend all eternity as believers in the very presence of the Lord. And, and I don't want to harp on this too long, but I, I do want to always encourage people when we talk about eternity, we always want to say when we talk about eternity with the Lord, that is, that's the good part, okay? Imagine, just to put it in perspective, imagine you live for all eternity exactly like the last seven days have gone for you, okay? I have no idea what you've been through in the last seven days. Maybe they've been a great seven days, but imagine that's all that life was, and forever you would live just like you have in the last seven days. The eternity that's being promised is in the presence of the Lord. It will be better than your last seven days, or however your week and month and year is going. And so this is the vision of God. And I want to sort of recast that. This is, this is one way of, of talking about the vision of God or the purpose of God. This is where God wants people to end up, right? This is God's purpose or even God's mission. This is what he wants. He wants us to be in this situation. Isn't this attractive, right? We read this and we're like, oh, that's what I would like. I'd love this type of living uh, the way God is describing it here. And obviously, there aren't a lot of details, but just what we see is that God is taking care of his people. It really is meant to be this vision of beauty. It's really what uh, God wants. Now, I want to compare this Old Testament prophecy with New Testament teaching from Paul. Uh, just a couple of verses I'm going to use on the screen there. Hopefully you can see the screen okay. Can you see this okay, Romans 1, 5? Is that okay? Yeah, good. Um, so this is Paul writing right at the beginning of the book of Romans. And I want to show this to you, and I want to see if we can put all this together here. So right at the beginning of the book of Romans, Romans 1, 5, and 6, through him, this is a reference to Jesus, and for his name's sake, again, that would be Jesus, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing to the church at Rome. Paul is writing before he ever gets there. So this is an interesting scenario for the Apostle Paul. Uh, he will eventually end up in Rome, but he is writing to the church before he's ever gotten there. The church has a large Jewish population. Rome is a Gentile city, a Roman city, uh, but has a large Jewish population. And, and so Romans is written both to Jews and to Gentiles. And he's talking right at the very beginning of the letter. And we just want to make sure. So through him talking about Jesus and for his name's sake, we, that's us believers, you know, he's talking about himself and the, the church in Rome, uh, us believers, uh, um, uh, we received grace and the apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. All right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that phrase just for a moment. I'm not a big believer in talking too much about the original languages uh, unless it makes a difference. And I think here it does. Um, the original Romans would have been written in Greek. And so this phrase here, all the Gentiles in Greek is written ta ethnos. Ta all ethnos is what's being translated gen Gentiles. The only reason I tell you that word is because there's another English word that we get from that Greek root. From that Greek root, ethnos, we get the word ethnicity or uh, uh, ethnic. And, and so the idea here is we are called, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the ethnicities, what's translated here, all the Gentiles. It's not the only word for Gentiles, but it's very common in the New Testament that that phrase is translated Gentiles. And it's a good translation. It's not about bad translations or anything, but it's just an interesting word. It's every different ethnicity. And you might wonder, well, why don't you just say from every country or from every language? And if you think about it, 
United States. United States is one country, but many ethnicities, right? You would have lots of different, you could find people with all sorts of different backgrounds. You find all sorts of different, in some cases, it's, there's tribal heritage and all sorts of different ways that people divide themselves up. And, and so ethnicity is one of the ways of talking about that. And the point is, it's all of them. That's really the point here, that people, uh, uh, that we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the ethnicities, all the Gentiles. Remember, in the Jewish fr- frame of speaking, and this is really written to a Jewish, uh, Jewish readership at this point in the book of Romans, they see themselves, Jews, and then everyone else is a Gentile, right? They, they have the, their one ethnicity and everyone else falls into the other camp, all, all the Gentiles, to obedience that comes through faith. And you also, he says to the church, are among those who are being called to Jesus, uh, to belong to Jesus Christ. So I want us to kind of keep this in mind, this particular phrase, all the Gentiles, that somehow through Christ, right, through him, through Christ, we're receiving the grace to call people from among all the Gentiles to obedience, okay? Calling all the nations to obedience, calling all the ethnicities to obedience, calling all the Gentiles to obedience. Just kind of keep that in mind. Now I'm going to show you the end of Romans, Romans 16, where Paul then brings this back together. So now we're going, we're right at the very beginning of Romans, right at the very end, because he pushes this together in a way I want to show this to you. So now we're in Romans 16. It's the last chapter, right near the end. And this is a doxology. This is written as a, a, as a sort of a poetic poem of praise to God. And it reads as follows. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, so that would be to God, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey in him. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how the book of Romans reads. All right, that's a lot. Let's kind of slow it down, make sure we can follow. Now we're talking about God. So now to him, that's God, to God who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. That is, the church in Rome is established by the work of Christ. Paul proclaiming it, uh, others who, who had heard it, or maybe Jews who had been in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and now returned to Rome and, and, and helped build the church there. So to God, who is able to establish you, the church at Rome, by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed." i to talk about that mystery. We've talked about it before, but I want to sort of talk about it again. Paul is bringing it up here. In the Jewish mindset, they always recognized Old Testament, New Testament. They always recognized they're the people of God. They always recognized they had a special relationship with God, that, that, that they were to be God's special chosen people, mentioned in the Old Testament, mentioned in the New Testament. And so they always saw that when Christ would come, Christ being a Jew was coming to save them. But here's the mystery that they didn't always understand. That Jesus came to save them, that is his people, the Jews, and everybody else. That's the part that they weren't always sure of. That's the part that they didn't do well often in the Old Testament as a testimony to the nations. They weren't always good at that. But Christ came not merely for the Jews, but for Thai ethnos, for all the ethnicities, for all the Gentiles. That wasn't clear, but now it is. And it's very important we understand this. Sometimes in Christianity, we can talk about mysteries and and people are uh, uh, talk about the, the mystery of God and so on. There is a mystery to God in the Old Testament. That is how he's going to fulfill his promise to Abraham. Just to remind you, Abraham, Genesis 12, verse three, God says to Abraham, through you, Abraham, all the peoples on earth will be blessed, or all the nations on earth will be blessed. And we're kind of wondering, well, how is that going to be? And that was a mystery that's made known in Jesus. That is, once we get our New Testament, 
there is no mystery. The mystery is made known. So God has laid all his cards out on the table, if we want to think about it that way, that that he has shown us what he's doing and what he's doing is accomplishing all uh, or saving all or providing the ability to save all through Christ, through Jesus. That is the mystery. So this is what Paul's talking about. According to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that the purpose is, now here's what I want to show you, all nations. It's the same Greek phrase that Paul used in Romans chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. The same phrase. So in Romans 1, if you're just reading your Bible in English, this is the NIV that I have on the screen here. If you're just reading your Bible in Romans 1, you're seeing the, the phrase, all Gentiles, And then if you keep reading all the way through Romans, you get to Romans 16 at the very end, the very same Greek construction is now rendered all nations. Our English translators are the best translators on earth. So this is not a comment on somehow the translation is bad. All I want to show you is that uh, uh, it's the same wording. So whatever we're going to do at the beginning, we're doing at the end. And we just need to understand what Paul is saying so that all nations might believe and obey so that all nations might believe and obey. So now let's go back and think about that phrase that John Piper said. Missions exists because worship doesn't. So Paul is saying, the very end of Romans, in this doxology, in this sort of poem of praise, so that all nations might believe and obey him. It's not talking about worship. But let's be honest, when a believer, when someone comes to faith in Christ, when they become a believer, part of what we do as a body of believers is worship the Lord our God. In fact, that's what we're doing right now, right? We are worshiping the Lord through the study of his word. So I don't want you to, when we say worship or praise, don't always think music. It, it could be music. Mostly in scripture, it's not music. So, so it, it, it means something different. It has a lot more to do with how we live our lives, worship, than the songs that we sing. Although do sing good songs. You can sing songs and worship to the Lord. That, that's all good. But it's more than music. So I, I don't want you to think that we're talking about music. So here Paul says that we want all nations, ta ethnos, all the ethnicities or the Gentiles, as it was translated back in Romans 1, that they might believe and obey. So there's something going on with God's purposes. God wants to create this this unbelievable Jerusalem or new Jerusalem. And we saw in Isaiah 65, this beautiful picture of the Lord delighting in his people and people living a long life and the pain and sorrow and the effects of evil being removed. And, And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful prophetic vision of what is yet to come that Isaiah is casting. And yet now we get to the nitty gritty here as we're looking in Paul in the book of Romans here. And we've got this call for all nations, for all people in this case, that all might believe and obey. That, that's really what Paul is praying for here and, and, and almost singing about uh, at the very end of the book of, uh, uh, of Romans here so that all nations would believe and all nations would obey. That's God's vision. So so God's vision is this peace and tranquility that he's going to create, this love that he's going to pour out, all sort of funneled in this vision of a new Jerusalem for all nations. That's really the idea. It's for all nations, for all people, to be really, really technical, for all ethnicities. That's really the word that's being used there. And so I want to show you sort of why. Why does that happen? How does that sort of uh, fit together? So if you have your Bibles, we were in Isaiah. We we just said a couple of passages. Make your way to Romans. We're going to go to Romans 15. Romans 15. Now I'm going to ask... What is the mission of God's people? God wants to create this perfect place that's being prophetically described in Isaiah 65 and the end of Revelation and in other places in Scripture. We're just using Isaiah 65 as an example. 
Paul is talking about the fact that that it has to involve all the nations. From the beginning of uh, of Romans to the end of Romans, Paul is talking to a church that's a blend of Jew and Gentile, and and ultimately the plan is to reach all nations. And and now I want to try and put all these things together. So Romans chapter 15, you'll see how we'll start to put all of this together. Again, I'm trying to flush out a theme here that exists. Uh, Romans chapter... Uh, 15, and we're going to begin in verse 8. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 8. Paul writes here, For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs might be confirmed, and moreover, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. All right, let's stop there and see if we can figure this out. So I know I'm picking up mid-sentence here, but I just want to kind of focus on uh, this particular section. Paul writes, I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews. So we're talking about the Jews right now, a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made to the patriarchs, okay, patriarchs, that's the founding fathers of Israel. So when the Bible talks about patriarchs, it's always going back to Abraham, and because God makes a promise to Abraham and renews it with his son Isaac, then we've put Isaac in there, and then because then he renews it with his grandson Jacob, we put Jacob in there. Jacob is going to get renamed Israel, so sometimes we say the patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and sometimes we say they're Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and by Israel we mean Jacob, by Jacob we mean Israel, you with that? So whichever way you say it, it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and often we include Jacob or Israel's offspring, which if you'll remember, he ends up having 12 sons, and so that would include people like Joseph and Benjamin and Gad and Asher and Issachar and Dan and and all the others, right? Um, and, And so those are the founding fathers and whether you include uh, um, Jacob's children or not, it, it, it isn't that important. In some cases in the Bible, they're clearly included. In some cases, they're not. It doesn't really matter. Um, but now let's go back to what Paul said. So that the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and really the promises made to Abraham and renewed with Isaac and Jacob. So I'm just going to say the promise made to Abraham might be confirmed and moreover that the Gentiles or all the various ethnicities, right? That's really the root of that word there, ethnos. It's the same word that we talked about in Romans 1 and and Romans 16. So that all the ethnos, the Gentiles, the nations might glorify God for his mercy. Okay? So now we're right back at that same thing that was being made by that, that statement that missions exist because worship doesn't. All people should be worshiping the God who created them. All people should be worshiping Jesus as their Savior who saves them. Not all people are, right? And so this becomes the poll, and this is what now Paul is talking about. God promised Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3, this Abrahamic promise, this Abrahamic covenant as it's known, that through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. Okay? So the plan is global. The plan is international. The plan is multinational. Everyone's going to be blessed through Abraham in some way. Obviously, Jesus is a descendant of Abraham, and that's how he's introduced, even in Matthew chapter 1 in the genealogy. Jesus is a descendant of Abraham that is ultimately to be the savior of all people, right? He's the lamb that uh, uh, takes away the sins of the world. He, he's the once for all. He, he's the center. So this is sort of how it's being put together. I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth, so that the promises made, and allow me to sort of uh, interject this, uh, interject this, the promises made to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, that the promise that through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed, that promise might be confirmed and moreover that the Gentiles, that is that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. It's the idea of when people come to find salvation, they give glory to the one who saves them. 
which ultimately is Jesus. So this is about Gentiles glorifying God. And now he grabs, and it's interesting how Paul does this. He's going to grab four different Old Testament references and put them all together because they're all kind of saying the same thing. He's going to grab 2 Samuel 22. He's going to grab uh, Psalm uh, 17. He's going to grab Isaiah here, and let's just show you how he does it here. So here's what he says. As it is written, now he's going to quote the Old Testament, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles or among the nations. I will sing praises of your name. I'm grabbing that from 2 Samuel 22. Again, it says, rejoice you Gentiles or rejoice nations with his people, with God's people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles or all you nations, all you ethnicities. Let all the peoples extol him. Uh, and again, Isaiah said, the root of Jesse will spring up, uh, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will have hope. So Paul gives these four Old Testament quotations, which basically all say the same thing. It's the idea of the Gentiles, the nations, or the ethnicities, however we want to say it, all coming to praise God. So we go back to that opening phrase. Missions exist, the idea of going to people and telling them about Jesus or showing them Jesus Missions exist because all image bearers are not worshiping the God in whose image they were made. Does that make sense? That's the problem, that we're not all living rightly. We're not living the way we were designed. Foolish example, but... I have young girls, so this helps me. So on some stuffed animals, some little stuffy toys for kids, there's a little tag that they have on now, and sometimes they name them. You know, there's different lines of, of stuffed animals. And they come with a name. They come with habits and so on, or what they're supposed to do. And some of them, you know, if you press the belly, they talk. They've got batteries in them, and they say things. It's all those silly things. We all need a tag like that. We all need that. And our tag needs to say, this person is made in the image of God and is made to bring praise and glory to God. That's our tag. People don't know that. It's people who don't know. There's also people who've heard and don't care. That's not my purpose. I want to do what I want to do. I want to live how I want to live. I'm going to do my own thing. What does God know? That book, that Bible that's so old, it knows nothing about today. But I want to show you what the Bible's going to do. And we're going to marry some passages together here. And I want to show you sort of the flow of how all of this fits together. And it's kind of neat to understand what God wants to do and what he's called the church to do and what we ought to do, turns out to be what's best for us. It turns out that that will be the abundant life. And I want to show you how that all fits together. Let's keep going with Paul here. We're in Romans 15. Pick it up in verse 13. We're going to go all the way to verse 20. May the God of hope fill you. He's now back talking to the church in Rome or, or writing to the church in Rome, excuse me, uh, with all joy and peace as you trust in him. What does God want for you? Joy, peace. I don't know what your plans are for tomorrow and the next day, but I can tell you what, jo what God would want to have you have. Joy, peace. We have those things. And let's be honest, often we lose those things, right? We can be believers in Jesus and not have a lot of peace. I mean, it isn't hard for us to get information and we can go and find out what's going on and what people are saying. There's a coming election and these things are going on and apparently this group is doing that and their plan is to go over here. And, and, and we learn all, it's easy to lose peace in our world. Lots of information available and lots of it tells bad stories, tells the stories of what bad people are doing, sinful people. May the God of hope, Paul writes to the church at Rome, fill you 
with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you might overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent uh, to instruct one another. Yet I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Or I hope you're hearing this the way it's written to the Gentiles, to the nations, to all people. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles or the nations or all ethnicities might become an an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders and through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to... uh, 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 I can't remember how they say that. Uh, uh, Ilaricum? Illyricum. There it is. I I couldn't remember how it was said. Uh, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of God. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And obviously Paul goes on. So, So he's sharing a little bit about this call for the nations so that God would be worthy, or or that God would receive the worship for which he is worthy. We need to explore that a little bit more. Turn back just a page. We did this a few weeks ago, but I just want to remind you of Romans 10, and another sort of run on on Paul, seeing this message go to the the nations here. Just back to to, uh, Romans chapter 10 here, beginning in verse 14. Um, Paul says, familiar passage, how then uh, can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? And if you remember, we talked about the God who sends that he ultimately sends. And we talked about Old Testament people who were involved in salvation in a small sense, and then ultimately sends Jesus as our savior uh, in a much bigger or much broader sense, and then goes on to send the church for its purposes in the exact same thing, to go and bring the good news. Not that everyone has to travel to a faraway place, but to be the testimony amongst the nations. And that's where the church finds itself, right? We find ourselves here in Frisco, the church uh, uh, in the next state over finds itself in that location. There are churches all over the world and, and we are to be the example in that place. That's the idea that we go. And of course the, the text ends uh, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. A quote all the way back from Isaiah 52. All right. So uh, let's, um, I think, Revelation here, Revelation 5. This is a, a nice way that I want to summarize what Paul was saying. This was written by John. Revelation 5, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea, and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. That is, it is a picture of one day, every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and on the sea. I I think that includes everyone, right? It's John's way of talking about all all people singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. It is the idea of when people are reached, then people praise. There's a, a tie there. There's a tie there. All right. So I want to ask the question, what are we created for? What are we created for? It's a question we've asked in the past. We've looked at some different answers. I I think it's always important that that we think about this as as we want to live godly lives. What what is our purpose? What what are we created for? So I'm going to use several passages here, and we're we're going to just sort of uh, look at them carefully. So Isaiah 43 
Um, again, we've already talked about Isaiah. Isaiah is prophesying here, speaking the word of the Lord. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I'm formed and made. And then it goes on to the next portion. But I want to just highlight that one part there, whom I created for my glory. So this part's easy. You were created for God's glory, right? It says it right there. That's easy. What does that mean? I mean, it's a beautiful phrase. You're created for the glory of God. So we think of language like the Apostle Paul talks about how he is enslaved to Christ, right? As, as, as someone who, who literally works for Christ, we were created for God's glory, kind of sounds like drudgery, doesn't it? Or couldn't it? It's like telling me that broccoli's good for me. I'm not sure I want to be good if broccoli's good for me. I'm not a broccoli guy. L- let it grow. I, I just, you know, let us keep it in the garden. Let it, let it do its thing. Looks pretty. I'm sure it does. You're created for God's glory. I can't do anything I want because I was, you know, this plaything for God. The reason I stop there is because we've talked a little bit about how God is glorified. You see, sometimes we think about serving God like I think about eating broccoli. And I apologize, if you're a big broccoli fan, hey, if we ever have it at our house, you're welcome to it. Um, but, 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 but you know what I mean? It, it can feel like duty or, or drudgery to, we're, we're created for the glory of God. We're created to serve the Lord. It doesn't sound good. Except when we ask the question, what brings God glory? It, it, if God wanted all of us to simply serve him because he made it so, he could have just made us all, forced us all to serve him, right? That somehow there's an irresistible force that causes us to serve God. We all work for God. We serve God. No one disobeys. No one sins. He could have created a world like that. He didn't. Created for his glory. And so we have to think a little bit about what glorifies God. What brings God glory? Well, we've already read several passages that talk about God being worshipped or glorified. And that's when image bearers bring to him the praise that he's due. Let's imagine that after tonight's Bible study, every one of you come up and tell me how great I am. I am so great. Number one, that feels good. And number two, it's a lie, right? It feels good to get praise, but I'm not great. Only my wife was here, right? And she'd set you all straight in a minute. But, but, but I'm not worth praising. Does that make sense? That, that there's a worthiness for bringing praise, and it feels good to be praised by others. You do well in your work or, or, or you have success in, in various areas. It always feels good to, 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 to receive the praise of people. But there's always a sense if you receive people's praise that not really that good or others could have done it better or whatever it might be. God, on the other hand, is worth praising. He has the worth that you and I don't have. In one sense, you and I aren't worth praising as somehow you are amazing beyond every other person or I am amazing. We're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're sinful, but God is without sin and God sends his son and his son takes our sin upon himself and pays for it with death on a cross and conquers that death and resurrected victory and clothes us with his righteousness so that we can come before God completely righteous, not that we're righteous, but we're wearing Christ's righteousness as he's taking off our sinfulness and has paid for that on the cross. And so 
he's worthy of praise. And praise is really good when someone is worthy of it. As you know, I grew up in Canada. My guess is none of you have been to the Pacific National Coliseum in Vancouver, uh, where I grew up. That was the former home of the Vancouver Canucks. They built a new stadium since then. Um, but uh, growing up uh, and going to some games in the Pacific National Coliseum, you might know all the Rocky movies were filmed in there. So if you ever see Rocky, the arena that they're in is actually the Vancouver Arena doesn't matter. Um, not that I'm advertising here, Rocky. I never even saw the Rocky movies. Or the, doesn't matter. Um, and so I always like to help people understand worship by comparing it to sports. And I would use any playoff game in any sport, assuming that it's being well attended, gives us a glimpse of what worship is. I remember the Vancouver Canucks, for most of my life, the Vancouver Canucks were not a very good hockey team. So they very, very rarely went to the playoffs. So when they went to the playoffs, it was a big deal because Vancouver is a big hockey town and it rains 300 days a year there. So lots of people are depressed. And so generally there's a very close correlation between the rain, the depression, and the Vancouver Canucks. They all fit together quite nicely, okay? And, and, and so when they go to the playoffs, it's a big deal. And I remember one year they were there, and I went with a friend of mine. We were able to get playoff tickets, and so uh, we're in the stadium, and, and there's just some really interesting things. We could yell as loud as we possibly could yell, and we tried this. I yelled in my friend's ear, two inches away, and he couldn't hear what I said. It was so loud in there. And I'm not exactly sure. I'm not a structural engineer, and so I don't know exactly how it was built. But the whole building vibrates, and everyone is, is clapping and cheering and stomping, and it's, it's worship. It was totally out of control. The, the only thing was the Vancouver Canucks. Any call for the Vancouver Canucks was clearly the right call. Any call against the Vancouver Canucks was clearly, I don't know what the refs were thinking, right? It, it, it's this one-sided mindset that we, we have singular focus for a couple of hours, or really only while the puck is dropped, right? Uh, while the game is going on, we have singular focus on one thing, and it receives all our attention and all our focus. And because everyone's doing it at once, I said, for okay, in this period, I'm not going to cheer, but it didn't matter. It was so loud in there, you couldn't help but cheer. I don't even know what I was cheering for. You, you just yell, you cheer and everything. The world knows how to worship. What a useless thing to worship. I can't even remember who the Canucks played. They won one round and then lost in the next. It, it, not, none of it really mattered. It wouldn't even have mattered had they won. But, but, but the, the point is that that, that singular focus, that 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 in one sense, you can go to a sporting event and you have these huge college stadiums, right? You go down and there's a hundred thousand people and they're focused on the, the football team. And it's, it's, you become part of something much bigger than you are. But yet there's no sporting event that's worth it. I love sports. I love watching sports and, and, and all that. I love football and, and all that. And none of it's worth it. And God is worthy of worship. He's worth it. There's actually a purpose in worshiping God. And it isn't merely that he does create us for his glory. But the way we were created, if you would read the little tag that you came with, remember you're made in God's image and you're made to give him glory. That's what you're made for. That is, that's when you're most fulfilled. I don't know how that could be. I don't even like music. It's not about music. It's not about singing. M maybe you're an outdoor person. You've been able to go somewhere. I uh, had the privilege. I was teaching in Africa. 2007, I was actually in the Sudan. This is before Sudan broke into Sudan and South Sudan. They're two separate countries now. I was in the, what is now South Sudan. And a very difficult situation doing pastor training with, with these poor pastors who had been through so much um, all the loss that they had experienced and working with how to study the Bible and how to teach the Bible in a war-torn country is very difficult. And on the way, the, after that, I had a week break before going on to Sri Lanka and working with some 
pastors there. And so I was with another missionary and I said, he says, like, what are we going to do in that week that we're in Africa? Like, what, what should we do? And I said, let's climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So in the week between being in the Sudan and on our way to Sri Lanka, we climb Mount Kilimanjaro and you, you, you climb the mountain and <clears throat> it's just an uphill walk. Like it's, it's not hard, although it's kind of shaped like this. And at the top, it's really steep just for a short period of time. It's really steep and there's no air up there. It's 19,345 feet tall and there's just no air. It's just really hard to breathe. Um, so you, you, you walk up and the idea they have in, in, in climbing a mountain, they have what's known as the death zone. It sounds very dramatic, but it's basically when your body, when your cells stop reproducing. So you don't want to do anything once you get above that height. And your body is literally starting the process of dying. So your, your cells aren't reproducing. So you don't have to go to the bathroom. You don't want to go to the bathroom. You don't want to eat. You don't want to talk. You don't want to sit, you don't want to stand, and you certainly don't want to walk. You don't want anything. You don't even know why you're up there at that point. And so the point is to get to that. It's about 15,500 feet that most people hit that. And when you, you want to get there as slow as you can, you want your body to acclimatize to not having the oxygen that it's used to. And then once you get there, you want to go as fast as you possibly can, the last 4,000 feet, right, from 15,500 feet roughly to 19,300 feet. You want to do that last part as quickly as you can, which happens to be, in God's grand design, the steepest part. And so the way that you do it is they want you to have enough time not only to get up but to get down. So that last day, you, you arrive at your last camp right at about 15,500 feet, and you arrive there like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You're supposed to go to bed. Well, you don't want to do anything. And, and, and then they get you up at midnight and you're the hardest part of the climb from midnight to 7, 7.30. I summited at 7.38 in the morning. You see the sun rising up in the east there and you're really, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro is interesting. It's the tallest mountain in Africa and there's no mountains around it. It's not a mountain range. It's a volcano that lost its lid right? And, and, and so you can just see forever up there. And it was pretty clear. And we could see a long time and we could see the, the beauty that God had created. And then we quickly had to get down. But, but you can experience joy in life, in what God has done in a whole variety of ways. You can uh, have the joy of fulfillment, of creating something at work, and, and it all working, it all fitting, it all coming together, all worthy of praising God for. That, that, that is, the worship of God is the recognition that if you're an engineer and you've engineered something that, that is all come together and working well, to God be the glory, right? It, it's not a song. It can, you can worship God with a song, but you can worship God with enjoying what you love to do, recognizing he made it. He gave you the love. He gave you the ability to climb a mountain or perform engineering or, or, or building a house or, 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 or going for a walk with your spouse or, or whatever it might be for his glory. That is giving God glory. God designed you that that's when you're most fulfilled. And we look for fulfillment in the Dallas Cowboys. Right? And that's the problem. God has a better idea of fulfillment for you than you have for yourself. Your vision of yourself, if you could get everything you wanted, the problem is you don't want enough. I'd love to go to a Cowboys game. Better? Love to have season's tickets. Even better, with a parking pass. Right? Because a parking pass would already make it too expensive. But un nonetheless, right? And, and so going to the Cowboys and having the tickets and having the... Really? That's where we're going to find fulfillment? Disney World? New boat, a fast car, whatever it might be. We, we look for fulfillment. And the tag that God built us for is, you will be most fulfilled... When you worship something of worth, it's not the cowboys, it's not each other, it's not our accomplishments, it's not our resumes, it's the one who created all things and who's redeeming all things. 
And so that's how it's designed. And so I want to show you here, uh, that's Isaiah, just further down, Isaiah 43, a little bit further down. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and owls, uh, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they might proclaim my praise. God wants you to praise him because that is what will be most fulfilling for you. Now I want you to go back to this problem. We've got people made in the image of God who are running around and they don't know the God in whose image they're made. And so this purpose of this church, uh, of the church, the call of the church to be a testimony to the nations, in some cases to send people, in some cases to go, but to live obedient lives and to live holy lives before the world that the world might be attracted to God. Why? So that they can be saved. Why? So God can be glorified. Why? Because he wants us to be fulfilled. Maximum fulfillment. Cowboys? Yeet. Maximum fulfillment, right? We don't get fulfilled in the things of the world. It's only ultimate things that bring fulfillment. And so that's the idea behind this. I form people, uh, I, uh, the people I form um, for myself, that they might proclaim my praise. We're, we're designed to praise him because it brings us the most fulfillment. Or, if you want to use the language from John, it brings us abundant life. Jeremiah 13, 4, as a belt is bound around a man's waist, so I bind the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah. Jeremiah is prophesying the divided kingdom, right? Israel in the north, Judah in the south. Uh, to me, declares the Lord, to be my people for my renown and my praise and my honor, but they haven't listened. And Jeremiah goes on. So the Old Testament prophets are, are talking about why we are created for the glory of God, for his praise, for his honor, for his renown, as it said here in Jeremiah. Uh, that, that's why we are created and, 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 uh, and what we are created for. And, and now I want to look at New Testament again. We want to drill in on how does this play itself out in the church, Ephesians chapter 1. We've talked about Ephesians before. Ephesians is really the letter written to the church about the church. It's written to the church at Ephesus that Paul planted. He's writing about 10 years after he planted it. We're going to tackle, uh, um, in the original, this was one sentence. This is one huge, theologically rich sentence. And all I really want you to notice, because we could spend a lot of time, it's, it's beautiful poetry. It, it, if you can just imagine, this is poetry. This is legalese poetry written by a lawyer, okay? So this is the fine print set to rhythm and rhyme in Greek. It's all one sentence um, that Paul wrote. And, and what I want you to look for is what's repeated. What's being repeated? Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's start off. This is about praise. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is praise to God who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So the heavenly realms is going to ultimately refer to eternity in his presence, that we're granted this eternal life through Jesus or because of Jesus um, is, is what's being expressed. For he chose us, God chose us, in him, in Christ, before the creation of the world. God always knew. Before the creation of the world, God always knew. A timeless God is not bound to choose people in time. He is above time. He always knew. He chose us um, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Okay, that's holy living, righteous living. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. He loved you so much, he wants you and Jesus to be at the same level in relationship to him. Sons. Jesus is his only son. You and I as believers in Jesus are adopted sons. I, I mean, you would think that he would say, look, I, I'd love for you guys to all just be slaves in my household. That's not what he wants. 
He, he, he wants us at the same level as his only son. Us at the level of Jesus adopted. That's what's being, it, it's, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. All this is one sentence in Greek, and it goes on from verse 3 to verse 14. It's all one sentence. Thank goodness in English, they put, they broke it up for us. In him, verse 7, we have, pardon me, we have redemption through the blood. Um, and forgiveness of sins, this is in Jesus, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. So what are the riches? That we can be forgiven, that we have grace. With all wisdom uh, and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. You see, Paul's talking about this again. Remember, he talked about it in Romans. He's talking about it again, the mystery of God's will, that somehow Jew and Gentile would both be saved through Christ. That was a mystery in the Old Testament, and now it's being revealed. He had made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pl pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment at the appropriate time when Jesus would come to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. So this was all part of God's plan that was revealed step by step, piece by piece. We call that progressive revelation from the Old Testament to the New. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan uh, of him who works out everything in conformity with the purposes of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also uh, were included in Christ when you heard the message uh, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed and when you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of, uh, of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's a lot. And we could, I mean, all of salvation is articulated in this beautiful poem ultimately that, that the Apostle Paul wrote. But three times he says something. He first says in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. And, and then he says uh, again to the praise of his glory in verse uh, 12. And then again in verse 14, to the praise of his glory. So what he's talking about is salvation, Jews and Gentiles, through Christ and all the beauty and the majesty that, that make that up brings praise to his glory. God is glorified in that because people praise. So when we talk about wanting to, as a church, we are called to to this mission to testify to the nations in the way that we live. That is, if we just want to speak directly to us here, how does Frisco, how is Frisco reached for Christ? Well, because we're here in Frisco, or wherever you might live, if you don't live in Frisco, we're here, we are to be the testimony that someone who doesn't know God, who doesn't read the Bible, who doesn't go to church, who doesn't love the Lord, looks at our lives, not only our lives individually, you as a neighbor or me as a neighbor, but, but, but us as a body of believers at the way we function as a body, as a testimony of, I'd like to be part of that. I'd like to be loved the way they love each other. That idea. That's how the nations are reached. That's how people are reached. A church of believers is a witness to those around them. And even can send people far away to faraway places. That's good too, and that's part of it. But ultimately the goal isn't for everyone to be far away. Imagine if everyone went to missions, well, now we have an unreached Frisco, right? If we all were somewhere else, serving somewhere else. And so that, that it's not about going somewhere else. It's about this obedient living, about this 
this which brings praise to his glorious grace. First Peter. But you are a chosen people, we've looked at that before, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Let's stop there. We've talked in the past about being a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, uh, because it's really Peter sort of hijacking an Old Testament thought for Israel and saying, yes, but this applies to the church as well. We've talked a lot about being a priest. And, and what that means, God's special possession. I want to pick up sort of the, the tail end of that verse, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So that imagery, you called out of darkness into a wonderful light. Can we just call that salvation, right? We're being saved from darkness to light. It's salvation. It's a, it's a picture of salvation, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The passage keeps going. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they might see your good deeds and worship God and glorify God and praise God. That's the idea. Glorify God on the day he visits us. But that's what it means. So our lives, the way we live, it's not, ah, oh, we all should just live better, right? Everyone should just do a little better. That, that's not what it is. That is our life of of faithfulness to God is a response to his salvation. Faithful living doesn't earn anyone anything. That is, no one can be saved by trying to be good or trying to do right. But once we are saved and once we recognize we are saved with a purpose, with a call, and our call is to live holy lives, which brings glory to God, which is a testimony to the nations. The problem we have is that people aren't worshiping. The temporary, the temporary, not fix, but the temporary treatment of the lack of worship is missions, temporary. Because one day Christ returns, Philippians chapter two, and every knee bows, Every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is, everyone recognizes he is who he is. Now, remember, demons do that too. James uh, chapter 2 tells us that even demons do that. There are people who will bow at the feet of Jesus, but who will not believe in Jesus as their Savior. That's what Philippians 2 is reminding us. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone will know. No one's going to go, I'm eh, not sure he's holy. I'm not sure he's, the, he's God's son. No one will say that. That'll all be very evident. So they'll bow the knee. But they may not worship. That is, that's what demons do. Demons know the truth. You can't bear witness to a demon. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. They know Jesus. They know God the Father. They know more probably than we know, but they don't believe. They reject. And so that's what God is calling us to is a life of helping people read their tag. You're made in the image of God. You are most fulfilled in bringing praise to the God in whose image you're made. You are most satisfied in helping your family, your children, your grandchildren come to follow the Lord. That's the idea, come to serve him. 
lots of passages here. Uh, this is kind of fun. I'll just give you a couple examples and we'll close here. Uh, Acts chapter 16. This is Paul and Silas when they're first in Philippi. Uh, this is Paul's second missionary journey. Uh, his desire was to ultimately go to Ephesus. Ephesus was large city. And yet he has this vision of a Macedonian man calling him to Greece. And so the only reason I bring this up is this is where with Paul, the gospel goes to Europe. So if you have European heritage, this is where the gospel first penetrates into Europe in Acts 16 when they go to, to um, Philippi. However, when they get there, there's already believers. So that's, I guess that's not true. Isn't that interesting where Paul goes, there's already God fears in places where he's been. They don't necessarily know of Jesus. They don't necessarily know the whole gospel, but like Lydia is in Philippi and she's already a God fearer, which is just interesting. So even when Paul goes there, it's even that God's already prepared the way. This is the gospel getting into Europe through, through the apostle Paul. And if you remember, um, <clears throat> The, the, they're followed around by a, a girl who's demon possessed and, and keeps calling out to them. And, and so Paul gets tired of the demon possessed girl calling out to him and casts out the demon. And, and then her handlers who used her to make money, she was a fortune teller and whatever, uh, realize they've just lost their livelihood. And so they turn on Paul and Silas and get the whole crowd to turn on Paul and Silas. We pick up the story in verse 22. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. Now they're Roman citizens and that's against the law, but that doesn't matter. Uh, after they were severely flogged and they were thrown in prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell meaning there might've been outer cells, but not that one. They are going to go into the inner cell and fasten their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. That's going to be your time to praise, Paul? You're a Roman citizen. You are not allowed to be beaten without a trial. You were. You're not allowed to be imprisoned without a trial. You were. And so now you're going to sing praises to God. What are the praises going to do? Well, if we kept reading the story, you'll remember God's going to send an earthquake. The earthquake's going to open up the inner cell, the stocks. They're going to be free to go. They're still singing. They're not done praising the Lord, so they stay. The jailer, fearing that his, his, his prisoners have escaped, is going to take his own life. And they're like, no, no, we're, we're still praising God. What is he asked to do? How can I praise God? It's an interesting picture of how it works. They were singing and praising after being completely mistreated. Number one, casting out the demon was a good thing. It set this girl free from this, this demonic life that she had lived. And, and, and they were praising. And that praise drew people in. We are to obey our call through praising. Again, don't just think singing. Singing's fine. Singing's good. But we praise God by giving him the worth that he's due. And he is the only one who has the worth. A couple of passages. Deuteronomy chapter 4. See, I've taught you the decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded, so that you might follow them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Okay, so God is giving his people uh, commands. They're about to go under Joshua and conquer the land. And so he gives them these commands. Observe them carefully, and we'll sh uh, for this will show your wisdom and your understanding to the nations. How do you reach the nations? Observe the law. Obey me. Walk with me who will hear about all these decrees and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And looking at the nation, we'll end up, they will look at the God of the nation. That's the idea. When other, uh, uh, what other nation is so great to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? So even the laws that God gives us, he gives us because he designed us and he knows what's best. So he gives laws. Your, your mouth wasn't designed to lie. 
So when we lie, we're, you, we're misusing something that God made in a way that it was never made for, and it never goes well. And it's interesting that our sin, we might sin with our mouth, but it tends to hurt in our heart, right? As we start to feel the guilt and the shame and good way to cover that up, well, let's lie some more, right? And, and then we try and fix our own problem by adding more sins on top of that. And why are you under so much stress? You know, our bodies weren't designed to sin. And every time we sin, it's very hard on the body and it starts to break down. And this is what the, 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 the context of the Deuteronomy passages is God saying, I've designed this so you'll be free. Don't murder. It's not going to be good. It's not good that you'd kill someone, first of all. It's not good on the inside either, right? Don't covet. If you keep wanting what other people have, lousy life. We love to covet. As a matter of fact, coveting is like marketing one-on-one. We, we, want, we want to show someone, start coveting this, right? And, and, and we, we don't covet. Right? And so the law was designed to set us free. Oh my goodness, we have to obey all these laws. And that's not what God was doing. He was doing it. What other nation so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws I'm setting before you today? The law was, of course, how to love. How to love God, how to love others. Colossians, Old Testament, New Testament. Here's Colossians. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, Paul says, that God may open a door for our message so that we might proclaim the mysteries of Christ for which I'm in chains. So if the Lord opens the door that Paul can proclaim the mysteries of Christ for which he is in chains, and those people that he would open the door to would come to receive Christ, they would become... New praisers, new glorifiers, people who worship God. That is, I'm doing missions only to increase the worship. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Pray for me. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Matthew 9, when he saw the crowds, this is Jesus, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Jesus looked at lost people. He saw them as harassed and helpless. And so he said, pray for the harvest. Why? Because workers bring them to Christ, bring them to faith. When they come in faith, they worship the one who saved them. They are fulfilled. There is a tie between we bring the gospel or we present the gospel or we demonstrate the gospel so that people will become worshipers or fulfilled. It's really the same idea. And so there's this, this interconnection between worship, which is the result of recognition that we're made in the image of God and we come to know the God in whose image we're made. Father, what a privilege it is for us to Consider these truths that you want us to live rightly. Not only because it's good for us, and it is good for us. It's the most fulfilling way to live. A life without sin is precisely how you've designed us. A life of joy and delight, as Isaiah 65 prophesied, would one day come. A life of joy and delight. And yet, there are so many who do not know you, the one in whose image we're made. And so we ultimately want to live rightly as a testimony to the nations, to the people around us, that they might see you and come to be worshipers. As believers, strengthen us 
empower us, give us wisdom to live wisely, to shepherd our families toward your son. Help us to live Christianly where you have placed us as a testimony, the nations, and in faithfulness to you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.